Well, that's a lot easier for Sherm to say that than me, so you know he's alive. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for braving out today. And those online, good to see you as well. Uh, you look beautiful in your robe and PJs. Um, we are going to tackle a passage, and when you get called in a pinch to preach, uh, preachers usually have that back pocket sermon. Uh, well, I decided why not tackle the most complex verse in the book of Colossians that I've never preached before. So open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Uh, we'll begin there. Uh, there is this uh, fascinating passage, but I wanted to set up kind of the idea, what it sets the stage for us to consider. And just to be fair, I like disclaimers. Um, it's going to come in really happy and, and hopeful in this message. I mean, that's what the gospel does. And we're going to feel like, like just really challenged and motivated. And this is going to get heavy, a little bit of toe-stepping. I think that's going to be Holy Spirit, not me. If it's me, then I did the wrong thing. And then at the end, I feel like we're going to have a sense of mission, duty, purpose. So if you bear with me, uh, that's kind of what I want to accomplish. Uh, so I love puzzles. I like to look at things. And I like to figure out what's missing in a puzzle. Uh, when you form a puzzle, put the border together, find out what color schemes go and what sections. Or you look at a diagram, and I wanted if you, wondered if you would just play a game with me, so you participate in this, and I'm going to show you a picture, and you have to tell me what's missing. You ready? Okay, so look at the screen. Let's look at this first one that looks like a car frame. What's missing? Say it out loud. Tires. Okay, great. Uh, maybe a window. Uh, other one that looks like a, uh, could be an elephant. What's missing? Okay, trunk, feet. Good. Okay. How about this next one? See, I was thinking a pilot, but uh, there you go. There's something missing here, and we, we can't move on until we fix what's missing. Now, obviously, a, a, another wing would help too, um, but uh, I'm not a pilot, so there you go. Um, in the book of Colossians, Paul's addressing this church, which um, sits in this per a period of um, space that's co considered modern-day Turkey. And in this area, uh, there's this small little bustling town. It's not well-known. Um, Colossae is not just this most uh, flamboyant town that everyone wants to come to and visit and vacation, but it is significant because it has a trade commerce route that goes through it. Um, the neighboring towns are more significant, but Paul wanted to write a letter to this church for some reason. Now, we don't even know if Paul even visited this church. Most likely he didn't. Uh, he raised disciples, uh, Epaphras, uh, Timothy. He sent them out to be church planners. I'm a big fan of that. And established this church in Colossae. And so this letter was written to correct some false views of theology. There's a lot of philosophy going on there. People were debating about man-centeredness, and he wanted to be God-centeredness. So this message, out of the gate, we'll read into it, just talks about the glory of Christ. And, and then he encourages them, as he does with every church, and he talks about um, how Christ is to be exalted and lived out in their faith. So let's look at Colossians 1. We'll begin with verse 15. And this is where you're going to feel like, wow, this is good. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I think some of us just need to underline that a couple times. All, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Woo! And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Are you feeling built up? Come on. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now listen to this verse. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up 
what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. I mean, this is a big buildup here. And I think if I just ended with verse 23, then we would have said yes. But 24 comes, and it comes for a reason. And here at Trinity Bible, we don't shy away from difficult passages. Uh, We take it in context. We read it in the fullness. And we want to ask the Lord, what has this to do with us? And so I don't know if you stumbled or jumped over this verse before. It was actually God's sovereignty in this. And about two weeks ago, I was studying this passage. And I came across this verse and underlined it a dozen times. And so much that the Bible is so marked up. And I just started chewing on this passage. Verse 24. There's something about that that's inspiring, but there's something that's very challenging. What is this suffering for his sake? I kind of have an idea. I I do better now than I did now, so rest at ease. And in my flesh, I'm filling up. We're filling up something in our flesh. What is lacking in Christ? That sounds like heresy, does it not? And so if we just, uh, I don't think that's what Paul meant. Let's move on. We're not doing scripture justice, are we? So let's look at the context. Let's look at this and consider what is the sufferings. Well, it's no mystery. You study Paul. You read the book of Acts. uh, You read any of his letters. You realize that most of Paul's letters, by the way, were written in prison. So how many of you have written letters in prison? Don't raise your hand. But it's a quiet place, I imagine. Maybe. I don't know. I've never been in prison. I just wanted to claim that. But a place where you can study and uh, really get a lot of work done. Uh, But he, I'm sure, was not in a glorious resort. I'm sure he was, um, of course he was beaten. uh, But he sends these letters out for the churches. And even when he was out of prison, he was ridiculed, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by a snake. (laughs) I mean, if you want to retire early, I think Paul has it down. But he never does because his mission is to not just do what he's doing now, but to go all the way to Rome to proclaim the excellencies of Christ anywhere and everywhere he goes and he meets So he understands, and I think the church would understand what it means to suffer for the sake of Christ. And here in our American Western culture, we don't have a lot of that. I don't believe that's going to last long. I'm not a prophet of this, but as I'm measuring things, uh, it doesn't look like a lot of freedoms may exist much longer. I don't know. Maybe they will. Regardless, my hope is not in our political system. My hope is in Christ. And so I want to build up my faith even stronger, my family's faith even stronger, the church even stronger, so that we can rest in the glory of Christ, and not to a man on an office. But even so, what does it mean to suffer for the sake of Christ? Well, it's laying down your agenda and exalting Christ. And then we get to this next part here. I'm filling up, Paul says, what is lacking in Christ's affliction. That's bold. Is there something lacking in Christ's atonement? Let me answer that real quickly. No. Nothing lacking is atonement. What does Paul mean? Well, before we even tackle that, let's just affirm the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy place is every year with blood not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then the next chapter, chapter 10, verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For a single offering he has perfected for all the time those who are being sanctified. What I love about this passage is it talks about this Holy of Holies, and inside the Holy of Holies there are just certain elements that the priest had to do, a, an altar where he had to drip blood on, the mercy seat, candlesticks, Uh, There was lighting and and, um, there was um, a huge canvas that separated uh, different parts of this. Only the priest could go in here. Do you know the one piece of furniture that was not in the Holy of Holies? A seat. Why? Because the priest's work was never done. Isn't it intriguing that in this passage, at the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he's 
seated at the right hand of God because, church, the work is what? Finished, to telestai, done, paid in full. So we read this passage and we're affirmed again that there is nothing lacking in Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his sacrifice is all sufficient, his atoning work displayed in full fruition. So what could this possibly mean? What does Paul mean that there is something that he must add to this? Jesus dies, suffers for all the world. He's buried, and according to Scripture, raised on the third day. He ascends into heaven. He reigns over the world. But yet, what still is lacking? Well, what if it's something that we are to do, to portray, to project, to live out? I feel like that's where Paul's going with this. He's understanding that we have a mission, and we're to carry this mission wherever we go, wherever we are, we're planted, we're to bloom and bask and boast in the glory of God. In your workplace, in your home, everywhere you go, you're to show Christ in good and hard and difficult and challenging places. You're to boast in Christ anywhere and everywhere he plants you. Not to long for something else, because then you will boast on him then at that moment, but immediately where you are in the midst of your challenge and your struggles, Boast in Christ and what you're doing. To show the love and the aroma and the affection of Jesus Christ in all that you do and all your expressions that he is enough, that he is worthy, that he is holy. That is our job. That you would make it your mission that the words out of your mouth would glorify your Father in heaven, that your actions would reflect everything your heart is beating about. And Paul is trying to motivate us to get us to be a love offering for Christ, to present ourselves as missionaries on mission, doing the work of Christ. Because what Christ cannot do is walk on this earth and represent him. He's called his disciples to represent him. That's what's missing, his representation. So what do you do about that? I think it kind of looks a little heavier than what we think. And I think we've got a little comfortable, and this is where the toe-stepping happens. There's a missionary named J. Oswald Sanders, and I read this uh, story about a missionary in, in India. And I think we have some of those guys that love missions in India present here. So this is evangelist. He goes to India, and he, he's not well-educated. He doesn't have a lot of money, but he has the love of Jesus, and he wants to give it away. Sounds like a missionary. And so he goes into this village, and he's kind of tired, he's exhausted, it's late in the day, he goes in, he lifts up his voice and proclaims Jesus Christ, he's just sharing about Jesus, gathers in the square, hopefully people will gather in and listen and repent and turn and follow Jesus Christ, yet he's mocked, he's ridiculed, they drive him out of town, and so exhausted, rejected, he finds a tree where he just wants to sleep, and if the Lord wills, take him. And as he lays under this tree right before the sun sets, he's startled by what seems to be the whole village surrounding him, and he thinks this is it. This is where it ends. He says, glory to God. And just then, this big man in the village, maybe the chief, comes to him, and he says, we came to see what kind of man you are out under this tree. When we saw your blistered feet, we knew you were a holy man. We want you to tell us why you were willing to get blistered feet to come to talk to us. See, when we get to a place where we want to play it safe, it's not comfortable, it's not easy, this place of complacency, we are not on mission for God. But when we put ourselves in a place that may be very uncomfortable, but for the glory of God, we are in fact on mission for God. And I'm not saying you must feel persecution, but I am saying this, you shouldn't shy away from it. If you're making decisions based on what's safe, then maybe the gospel isn't sufficient to you. Because Jesus isn't safe. He's good. He's worth it. But there's risk. There's a ab selfless abandonment that has to come. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we will never go where Jesus already isn't. I was on mission in Honduras, and I remember standing on this post and on this mountain, praying over this mountain, and I was just, the missionary, our translator was there, and I was just praying and asking the Lord, uh, Lord, just would you join us here? Sounds really spiritual, right? Would you come here? Would you reveal to the people of Honduras the need for you? 
would you just show up? And we prayed and amen. And then the translator nicely pulled me aside and said, oh, pastor, I just wanted to remind you something. Jesus is already here. And I had to remind myself, oh, I'm, I'm joining in what God's already doing. And I think that's where we have to recalibrate. We need to learn to rejoin where God already is and what he's doing, that we would be on mission. So what's missing? Our representation of Christ. First Peter chapter 3.15, Peter takes this in his realm. He says, but in our hearts, honor Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. I realize that this context here isn't just always be ready, but especially be ready when you are put in a corner. Don't back out, don't compromise, don't be um, violent, don't be angry, but present Christ with salt and light. COVID has been nasty, but I'll tell you what COVID has done for me, at least, is it's pushed me out of my house. I think we're supposed to be in our house, but I'm the opposite, right? So uh, all my neighbors are just out in the front yard. Now, I'm not uh, um, the best landscape artist uh, of my yard, but I sure like to get out there and pretend. And so during this COVID season, this lockdown and whatever, whatever we're doing, I'm out there all the time digging up something, planting something. And you would think I'd have the most manicured lawn around, but I don't. It actually has a lot of holes and little things leaning here and there, but I'm out. And you know what happens? I'm meeting neighbors. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> That's nuts. Bonkers, I'll tell you. And as I'm meeting neighbors, I'm learning their needs. I'm learning their hurts. I'm learning that they are far from Jesus. And so, hi, my name's Pat. Can I talk to you about Jesus as we plant this magnolia tree? I am about this mission, this space right now, and it's in these times I am finding, looking for, asking the Lord to use me in as, as crazy a way as it could be to intercede for my neighbors. I can tell you all my neighbors around me, and I can tell you kind of where they are generally in their walk because of COVID. So I say, God, look at you doing this. Now, I, maybe I would have done it without COVID, but somehow I'm pushed out. And I'm just telling you, there's an opportunity to reflect Christ. And especially the places that are uncomfortable. So let me push a little further. When I was in Israel, I was on a, a tour mission trip, is how you say it. And it's not the um, most uh, happy place for Christians. And there's a lot of hostility there in general. It's the most fought over piece of soil on the earth. And as I was there, our team was doing uh, a tour of the uh, museum. In fact, they were at a site en route to the museum. And I felt a little sick. I didn't want to go out that morning. So I stayed back. The team went off to the, um, to the site and they were going to go to the museum about noon. And I thought, maybe I'll join them. Well, noon came around. I thought, I'm getting bored. I'm going to the museum. So I go to the lobby, I ask them to call a cab, they call a cab, and I'm thinking, I'm sure they're going to communicate in Hebrew what has to happen, because my Hebrew is very limited, shalom. And so um, as the taxi driver comes, they just point me to him, I look at him, I'm speaking a little bit of Hebrew, other than just shalom, and he's looking at me at confused, and he starts speak, speaking, I think, Arabic. And so I'm like, ooh, we're really in trouble now. And um, I pieced together some English, and I showed him a map, and he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, hop in. So I hop in, and we just take off, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> Lord, I love you. And so uh, I ask him, you know, what's his faith? I just thought that was just how you should start a conversation. And he says, I'm Muslim. I'm like, oh, great, yeah. Well, we start talking about the city. We start talking about Israel. And I thought about just shut it down, just shut it down, because um, you'll have to decide whether you're going to share your faith or not in an enclosed car with a Muslim. And so uh, I prayed, and I thought, here we go. I said, uh, uh, well, what, tell me about your Muslim faith. He shared a little bit about it, and he said, are you Muslim? I said, no, 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 I'm not Muslim. I thought, oh, thank you for thinking I fit in. You know, but then I thought, no, I'm a Christ follower. You're, you're Isa that you mentioned in your book, Isa. That's who I follow, and he is the Messiah. In fact, he's coming, he's returning, and he is the full fruition of peace, the shalom. And as we pull to the gate, these two Israeli guards come out with guns, and they start yelling at the cab driver about something. He looks at me, okay? I'm in the passenger seat. Looks at me, and they tell him to pop the trunk. Can you imagine where your mind's going right now? So trunk being popped, machine guns on either side, go over to the trunk, and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, this is where it goes, and it's going down now. And 
the trunk shuts and they yell at him. He yells at them. All this language, I don't know, I know any of it. Maybe they're smiling and happy and talking about getting coffee together. I have no idea. But they move on. We pull over. And I thought, oh, God, you still have a mission for me. I said to this man, Mohammed, go figure. I said, can I pray for you? And he's like, oh, sure, he shared these things. I said, but I'm going to pray in the name of Esau. And I prayed, and that was our time and our space. But in that whole story, I had a lot of options to opt out. Now, I don't know what God will do from that story. I know the gospel was shared. (laughs) I know that he'll use it in his way. But I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel easy about the language. I didn't know if I was going to make it alive. Yet God uses us to be on mission. When Paul says to live as Christ, to die as gain, he's saying to be on mission when afflicted, even if death is on the line, that's the greatest gain in this world. We had these bracelets back in the 90s called WWJD bracelets. Anyone remember these? I think it was a great reflection to stop and pause and think and ask that question. What would Jesus do? I started thinking about this, and I'm not going to begin printing these out tomorrow, but maybe, I don't know, I thought about what if we did hair JT, H-A-I-R-J-T. How am I representing Jesus today? You see, it's a little more convicting to me because I'm going to come to the end of that answer and either say, yes, I represented you well today, or no, I didn't. I was disobedient, and I didn't represent you. I don't want to be filled with shame, but I also want to be motivated by the glory of God. And so what if I asked, how am I representing Jesus today in all that I do? Every phone conversation, every business meeting, every Zoom meeting, every family discussion, every conversation with my spouse, every neighborhood visit, how am I representing Jesus today? Because that, my friends, is why we are still alive. Check your pulse. Are you doing this? You good? You are here to be on mission, to boast in Jesus Christ. I don't know of any other purpose than that. We're not just trying to get by to build up our 401k. We are here to boast in the glory of Jesus Christ and all that we do until he returns. So may we, with such confidence and boldness, be in fact these ambassadors for Christ and stop assigning to someone else or not right now. Let me give you some next steps for all of us. Number one, let's put on Christ first and foremost every day. So I have a good morning ritual, routine maybe that's better. I wake up, I say good morning God. I don't think, oh, I'm late for a meeting or what am I going to wear or the dog needs me. (laughs) I say good morning God. Why is that important? Because it prioritizes God above all else. What a way to start a morning. I'm not 100 on that, by the way. I fail sometimes. But when I set apart Christ as Lord, man, I am thinking, God, what do you want to do in me today? So put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Colossians 3, whatever you do, word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Number two, be faithful, stable, and steadfast. Colossians 1.23, if indeed you continue. Now Paul's conversation was don't tap out, but he's saying as you journey in this, as you continue to journey. By the way, the, the Great Commission, go and make disciples, it's actually included that as you go, make disciples, not if you want to go. I don't know how you've been reading it lately, but it's as you go, <laughs> make disciples. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. So be ready in season and out of season. Number three, represent Jesus to everyone everywhere. Colossians 1, 28, that we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may pre- present everyone mature in Christ. If you're stepping out and joining God in this mission, I promise you this, that you will experience some suffering, some affliction, some pain, maybe even death. But I say glory to God and struggle well. If you sense tension in your relationships because of your faith in Jesus or awkwardness in sharing your faith, fumbling around, where is that John 3 something something? Great, 
you're taking a step forward, if you're extremely risking your life, or maybe buying a one-way ticket to a country, to a people group that doesn't even know Jesus by name, so be it. Glory to God. But if you are more concerned about being comfortable, about playing it safe, about just being a good person that coasts by and doesn't bother anyone, then maybe you haven't really joined Jesus in on this mission. If our concern is that what will this cost me rather than what will this cost Christ, then we've been sold the wrong gospel. However, when you can't wait to talk about Jesus and share his story to live for Christ and take radical steps forward, inviting people into gospel conversations, then you are living with great power and great position with great purpose. And there's nothing else that matters. And this is what you too can say is lacking in Christ's afflictions. You will never regret what you do for Christ or what you give to him. Make it your aim to boast in Jesus and all that you do. Good morning, God. I am your servant. Use me for your glory. And let's watch how God does, in fact, do that. Could we be so bold? Could we trust our Savior so much? I pray we would. Let's pray. God, we love you. We greet you. Maybe on behalf of my brothers and sisters, I can just say good morning, God. We didn't have to wake you up or stir you. You were not slumbering. You're not on vacation. You were active and present. But in our own lives, may we learn how to reset, to set you apart as Lord today. That we wouldn't take this gospel message and shelve it on our bookshelves of faith, but we would activate our faith in such a way that there is life and death on the line. And we'd be so bold to trust you as the saving grace in all circumstances, to give us the words that we need words, to give us the actions when we need actions, but to best represent you, to showcase the glory of you in all that we do. God, may we relearn, recalibrate about our mission today, our neighborhood, our homes, our workplace, that with intentionality, we would look for the opportunity to say, yes, Jesus, this is yours. He's yours. She's yours. This time is yours. My life is yours. We would live with certainty. We would live on mission. And even when we're afflicted, we would struggle well for your glory. Thank you that you're enough. Thank you that you're sufficient. And you've given us all that we need for today. May we boast in you in Jesus' name. Amen.